everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar about Google Dataset Search. Um, before we start, a couple of practical things because people are already starting to ask questions in the chat. Uh, so you're all muted because we have many people on the line. Uh, we do, of course, encourage you to ask questions, but we ask you to use the Q&A functionality for that. So you should see a Q&A button on your screen. And if you go there, you can ask questions and data site staff will be monitoring those questions um, and we'll be asking uh, our speaker those questions after her talk. And hopefully we'll, we can get as many uh, questions as possible answered. And if we don't have time to answer all questions, then we'll be making the answers available on our website afterwards. Uh, and we'll also be sharing a recording of the webinar because several people asked that. Um, so yeah, then I'd like to welcome today's speaker, Natasha Noy from Google. Uh, Natasha is a scientist at Google and she leads the team building Google Dataset Search. Uh, we know that Google Dataset Search has generated a lot of interest in the data community, so we're very excited to have her speak today. And yeah, Natasha, thanks so much for, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for joining the call. Um, so. Um, I will talk, for, I think I'll talk for maybe half an hour and tell you a little bit about data set search and where we're coming from and maybe a little bit of how we built it and what keeps us at, up at night these days. Um, and then I want to spend at least half of the, this hour answering questions so that we can actually have a conversation and I can learn what, keep, what and, and I can try to answer your questions. So um, let's see. Um, as you know, we've launched the uh, data set search uh, a couple of months ago. And so um, the basic idea there is we wanted to provide a search engine just for data. Uh, you know, Google does a pretty decent job. It's well, pretty good job at searching the web, but data is a very specific slice of the web. And so we wanted to build essentially what we sort of colloquially call a Google Scholar for data. And I think given that this is a data site webinar, I don't need to explain to you why we needed this. I think it's sort of all of you know about repositories like RE3 data that lists about 2000 data repositories, data set, uh, you know, nature scientific data, which is the nature, uh, nature journal that requires um, its authors to publish the data when they publish papers they recommend 58 different repositories not one not two but 58 data site itself has more than 1600 repositories uh, and this is just a random sample of them so basically there's a lot of data out there and it's sort of a good news right it's a good news that we're sort of now have this culture of publishing data but we're really it's more of a culture of getting the data out there without and then finding it is hard so most scientists in their own niche community, and I'm sure sort of most of you will feel that way, actually know where the data in their community is, right? So, you know, if I'm, you know, particular part of, like in particular part of climate science, I know where to go for that data. But once we start branching out into interdisciplinary research, or if we're new to the field, or if we're not super plugged into a particular research community, then it gets hard, right? And it gets hard to find what the data is. Um, and so basically that's why we decided to build data set search where, um, you know, it's basically a search engine. Um, and it's, and what's important, I think that's what I'll try to emphasize several times during the talk, uh, is a search engine over metadata. So our goal is not to kind of bring the data to Google. And again, Google Scholar parallel here is really a good one because you know, all of you are familiar with Google Scholar. You know, you use Google Scholar to find where the particular publication is, and then you go to the publisher site or to the author site to get that paper. So same thing here. We're basically searching over metadata. I'll go over, like, I'll talk a little bit at the end about looking into data, but emphatically, it's a search engine to tell the users where the data is, right? And then to take the users to the repositories where the data is, because ultimately, for a specific community, for a specific type of data, a specific repository will always be better than something that's super generic. So search engine over metadata, it's also search engine over metadata in a particular set of formats. So uh, mostly it's schema.org and a little bit of DCAT, and that's what we are focusing on. 
So to give you an example, I'm sure most of you have seen this in some form. So this is a screenshot I took of data set search. So basically you type in, um, you, know, you, you, you type in some search terms, you get some results, and then for each result we show some salient metadata, like the name of the data set, its description, its provider, you know, maybe temporal coverage, but basically it is whatever it is that we get from the data set providers. I mean, we, again, I'll talk in a minute about what we do with the metadata and how we try to enrich it, but ultimately it's sort of data set search is only as good or as bad in a particular discipline as the kind of data set providers allow us to be. Um, and I know there are a lot of data set providers on this call, and so <laughs> part of my sort of, I hope that sort of we can figure out what is the easiest way for everybody to provide metadata for us to sort of kind of bring use that metadata to help users find you. Um, so just kind of another point, we sort of being an international company, we tried to launch in multiple languages. So if your metadata is in French, we'll show it in French. And if you know you're in France, we'll try to sort of do it in French and whatever. I think they're like a dozen languages that we support. So as I mentioned, it's a search engine, it's a search engine over metadata, and most important, it's a search engine over metadata from data providers, like many of you in this case, right? Um, so we um, specifically, as I mentioned, sort of we use schema.org for that. Uh, so this is kind of a little screenshot. There are di different ways to provide schema.org um, for, as, as to, describe, to describe your metadata, JSON-LD is probably the easiest and the most readable, uh, but it could be microdata, it could be tags embedded in HTML. And so the reason we're really sort of using, so why are we using schema.org um, uh, as our way to get structured data? And there are a few reasons here, some sort of kind of open ecosystem type reasons and some are purely pragmatic. So first of all, it's an open standard, right? So it was a standard that was initially uh, developed by a consortium of search engine companies in 2011, I believe. And so many companies, and may, there are many companies that support and understand that uh, there are, you know, there are lots of open source tools that use it. So it's an open standard. So if you, for example, provide schema.org on your site, uh, it's not just for Google. Right. Um, what's important also that it's uh, it's adopted in a lot of different products, and it's not just for data sets either. And in fact, for example, I know Google uses it when you see, for example, when you do Google search and find, you know, fact checks, for instance, for news, and it says, you know, this was fact checked by PolitiFact and it's true or false, or if you find events listed in a structured way or job search, all of that is actually anything almost anything you see kind of structured, it's all based on the metadata provided in schema.org um, by data providers. Uh, same for Bing, Bing uses it extensively. I know Facebook uses it. So, a lot of, so there's a lot of support kind of within uh, the companies as well on sort of a lot of infrastructure support, for example, at Google for something like schema.org. And again, it's not, it's, 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 but it's an open standard. And I know sort of some of you on this call have actually participated in the discussions on GitHub on how, for example, to extend the definition of a data set. So it's sort of, we, uh, all of those discussions are in the open. Many, there are many participants. And actually, as we started working on data set search, um, we sort of picked up those discussions and I think there were several changes to schema.org data set, for example, as the result of those. It's also web friendly format, right? It's embedded in HTML, so it's, um, there's some other standards, for example, that are kind of XML based standards that you need to take the file, unzip it and understand XML. That's much less web friendly and we're sort of in the web world. Um, and it's really easy. For those of you who have added it, you know, it's really easy to add. So, since we've launched, one of the most common questions that we've gotten, and I want to get it sort of out of the way here, is where is my data set? I can't find it. I tried data set search, and I can't find my data set, or more frequently, there's this data set that I know about, and I couldn't find it. Where is it? And so there are usually sort of a couple of answers to that, and usually between these answers, you will sort of, one of those answers will probably get you to the real reason. So first and most likely, there is no metadata. 
so, you know, when someone asks me, you know, there's such and such data set, here's the web page for the data set, why don't you have it? The first thing I do, I put it into the, like I basically look if there's metadata. I'll put it usually in the Google structured data testing tool and see if there's any metadata there. And if it's not there, then, you know, sort of at this point, data set search is pretty binary in that way. If a page doesn't have the markup, it's not gonna appear. If it does have a markup, I mean, it might be duplicate or whatever, sort of, it's not guaranteed the other way, but it's pretty much guaranteed that if it doesn't have it, it's not gonna appear. Then, as you know, a lot of repositories, sort of the only way to get to specific pages is through search. So there's no kind of natural way to navigate to every page, which means there's no natural way for a crawler to find it. And so that's where sitemaps come in. And sitemaps is a nice way for uh, basically any data repository to list, here are all the data sets that we have. Here are the, basically to list all the pages, uh, all the landing pages for the data sets. And this, it's not a requirement at all, but it actually helps all the crawlers to find those pages much more easily because rather than trying to figure out which search term to put in to get to the page, you know, just list them. Um, and then you can look for, so, the, and both kind of the metadata and the sitemaps is not specific to Google, but then for example, if you want to see for a specific, um, for a specific search engine, whether or not they have crawled you that, you have a search console that tells you that, and you can register your sitemap there. Another point, because I know there are a lot of data set providers on this call, another point I would like to mention is, there is this always, the question that has come up fairly often is, you know, there are kind of two types of pages in any data set repository. One is kind of a page describing an individual data set, and then there are search results, right? So if I search the data set for a particular term, I will get a listing. And where should the metadata be? And in theory, you know, nothing, to, nothing prevents you from putting it in both places. For data set search purposes, it's really important that that metadata is present on the profile page, on the page for a single data set. And the reason for that, sort of, if you kind of turn it around and think about a search engine, right? So when you search for something in data set search, it would take it to a link. We want, to take, we want to take it to a link to a specific page. Again, scholar analogy here works really well. You know, if I search for something uh, and, you know, it gave me a a paper as a result and I clicked on the paper and instead I got on the like search results on Elsevier for instance that wouldn't work so well so it's sort of if you think about the usage that's kind of the best place to put it is on those individual pages um, let's see so that's kind of as far as what it is and how sort of and like what actually ends up in data set search and sort of from the point of view of pra pra practical point of view of a provider kind of what does it mean to you so I want to spend a few minutes telling you what actually kind of what happens inside once we crawl and get that data and get that metadata. And kind of at the high level, you know, we get, so at the moment there are about, I, I would say the number of domains that have schema or data set or DCAD data set is in the thousands. Um, and sort of individual data sets are somewhere in the millions. And so we get all of that, and then we try to do a few things. One, we, we try to clean it up, uh, because one of the things we, um, we have discovered is that, you know, once you start operating on the web scale, every possible sort of, um, every possible mistake will occur. So even for something as simple as dates, every possible representation, people would put sentences in places of dates, uh, for things like flat and long, folks will swap flat long. So basically, we, need, we do a lot of data cleaning. We um, integrate uh, with the knowledge graph. So we have a knowledge graph in the company, as pretty much any company has now. And it has a lot of information about things like um, organizations, places. So we can use the knowledge graph, for, for example, to... Uh, so for the types of fields that we know, for example, take organizations, something like a funder or provider of a data set. So if we know it takes organization, we can take that string, try to reconcile it to a particular object in the knowledge graph, and then use that knowledge graph ID to be able to, for example, um, retrieve that object even when it's... Um, uh, when they use queries in any other language to use all the different misspellings, acronyms, etc. So use, uh, and, and you know, for locations, for example, to use the 
uh, containment and kind of other properties. We'll also try to um, reconcile to um, uh, Google, uh, try to find data citations in Google Scholar. At this point, this is very, very rudimentary. But basically, what do you have? You know, would you have Google Scholar? And so we, we try to look at, um, you know, how many publications have mentioned this particular data set, either by its digital object identifier or its URL or its name. So kind of a little bit more of a, you know, computer science architecture diagram. Basically, the way this all works is, you know, there's a web out there and you all have those pages there. We have the web crawl that takes essentially looks at every single page as part of the regular crawl. So there's actually no special crawl for data set search. So, which is great because, you know, we could build this tool without having to build a new crawl, without having to worry about parsing any pages. All of that happens automatically because uh, basically Microsoft's, Google's, any, any web crawler usually understands this markup, usually understands this markup and basically extracts triples from that. And then what we do is we kind of look at all the pages that have triples with, you know, that have type human or data set and a bunch of others. And we say, okay, this is the vocabulary that we understand. Um, so we can extract this metadata. Uh, from there, from all of those pages and kind of create records for each metadata. And then that goes into sort of our own catalog that we maintain for all the data sets that has those millions of data sets where we do sort of for each record, we do all of those things like cleaning, um, reconciliation to the knowledge graph, uh, linking to Google Scholar. And another thing, once it all, it's all in a single catalog, another thing that we try to do which may, those of you who have used data set search probably have noticed is identifying sort of replicas across replicas of the same data set across different repositories. As many of you know, I'm sure know, uh, you know, data sets, particularly sort of quote unquote, oh, not quotes actually, good data sets do tend to be replicated across multiple repositories. And so what we want to do is to actually tell the user, okay, here's the data set you're looking for. And here are the three different places where you may find it. And you may go to the place that you trust or to the place that looks familiar to the place that kind of, I don't know, whatever, the, whatever way you want to choose the place. And so because we end up collecting everything from the whole web, we can actually do this kind of identification of replica. Obviously it's not foolproof. There's, uh, unfortunately the linking, the explicit linking is not very present. So yet, so we kind of have to guess often, but we still sort of try to do as good a job as we can. And I'm sure those of you who have tried it could easily poke holes in the job that we do, but we do try to sort of, we actually work quite hard trying to identify those sort of clusters of replicas. As most of these clusters are just sort of a couple of different repositories that have um, specific data sets. Sometimes it will be a very large cluster for some very, kind of heavily reused data set. It's also kind of a nice ranking signal. So if a data set tends to be replicated across multiple repositories, it's probably valuable enough. And so we can use it in ranking. Which brings me to the other side of this picture. So once we have sort of created this catalog and cleaned up um, you know, all the metadata, reconciled it, created the replicas, and we you know, do this regularly, obviously, uh, we, we index all of this, all this enriched metadata, uh, and basically that's what you end up querying when you go to data set search, you know, there's a query and then the ranked result list comes back. Um, so um, ranking obviously is a big issue here. Um, and I don't think anybody really knows how to rank data sets and um, we don't know that either, to be honest, we're kind of experimenting. Uh, for the moment, we're mostly, for the large part, not exclusively, but for the large part, we're basically using web ranking because that's all we have. But, you know, all these pages actually do live, uh, like, you know, all of these are actually web pages. So there is actually a pretty strong web ranking signal in there. So we're mostly on web ranking. We add some additional signals like citations and metadata quality. Uh, because in the end, we actually also want a really good user experience. So, but that's, definitely work in progress and we're sort of hoping that actually as we as the users are beginning to use data set search we can sort of figure out other better ways to rank data sets uh, so and that sort of brings us to sort of 
to, to all these research questions that you know we're thinking about and that um, we can kind of talk about more in the second half of this. So after we announced, so as I meant, so we announced this at the beginning of December, announced the launch and sort of things, it has been kind of working quote unquote reasonably well. There are a lot of things that it still doesn't have as I'm sure all of you would be happy to point out. I know them all as well. Um, but there are a lot of things that sort of we uh, so that we know we still need to think about and that are very interesting to think about and that sort of will kind of bring us closer to real kind of ecosystem where data becomes a first class citizen so the first question i already mentioned sort of is is the ranking right we don't really know yet what the signals are for for ranking data sets and we would like to figure it out um, another really important thing is data, is data provenance. So I talked a little bit about, you know, we cluster replicas together, right? So we cluster different replicas of a data set and different repositories together, but this is obviously not good enough, right? Uh, so ultimately you actually want to, you as a user want to know, okay, so ideally you want sort of the whole picture of the provenance, right? So here is the primary location for this data where it was actually first published and created. Here where sort of it was aggregated um, in, a, in this repository and then maybe uh, later on sort of here is someone who has added some value to that metadata because just the fact that something is downstream from a data set doesn't mean that it's somehow, you know, has less information. And sometimes it does, right? Sometimes sort of we observe and it's sort of interesting been now, interest has been pretty interesting now to sort of see how sort of metadata migrates and gets small and then gets larger. But, but ultimately, sort of both things could happen, right? And anything, so if you think of the um, original data set publisher being sort of upstream and kind of the, when that data gets republished being downstream, there could be better metadata or there could be worse, right? Some, People in some sort of downstream publishing, someone might have cleaned the data, maybe annotated it better, maybe described the types of information in there. So uh, how do we determine that? How do we find out uh, what those are and sort of actually tell the users uh, in a meaningful way, kind of what, it, what is the provenance of the data? Um, how do we improve the quality of the metadata itself, right? So as I mentioned, we basically start with the metadata that the data providers tell us and we try to improve it a little bit already, right? So we try to clean it up, to, you know, reconcile to locations, you know, we try to add scholar and knowledge graph, other, other sources. Can we learn from other sources? Can we, um, you know, can we, so for example, at the moment we use the web page itself where the metadata resides, we use it very little, but there is probably enough and a lot of information in there that has never made it into metadata. So there are a lot of other sources that we can use to improve the metadata itself that we haven't really explored. And again, it's not just us. And when I, so all of this actually, in fact, all of this kind of questions that we're thinking about, they're probably research questions for others as well as for us. Um, also, kind of going back to sort of relating data sets to each other, it's, I want to say fairly easy, but it's not like super hard to identify like this is really the same data set. What would be really useful and what probably will change in a sense uh, the way we think about data sets and the way we search for data sets, if we could tell you, well, you know what, you're looking at this data set, there's this related one here, right? Or, you know, we looked, um, and this maybe sort of you have the data, but there's this one that actually has similar index but complements what you have, right? Uh, or you can join this data set. So this data set would make sense to kind of create a union on them and one complements the other. So finding the similar data sets, related data sets, uh, something that would also be useful as you're looking at a data set um, is definitely an open research problem, which also plays into the last one that I have listed on the slide, sort of. I started by saying we're emphatically kind of looking into metadata and we're sort of search engine over metadata. Um, so I want to qualify that a little bit by saying, while we sort of as data set search, and again, this is now specific to data set search, aren't really looking at being a repository for the data. Actually having access to the data where we sort of a license and our crawls are allowed to get to it could improve discovery. And so ultimately what I think we want data search to be and sort of similar tools is to be the 
kind of best uh, data discovery engine. And so in so far as the data itself can help discovery, uh, we would like to look at it. So for example, you can imagine, you know, the metadata being fairly sparse, but as we open the data set, we will see that, you know, there's this column with all the states in the United States, for instance, right? All the countries in Europe, all the cities in France. So then we, even if the metadata doesn't really say that it's about all the cities in France, we could actually infer that from, from the content. So looking inside the data, understanding the content of the data insofar as it helps data discovery is sort of something that we also thinking about. So finally, uh, sort of, uh, I, before I switch to question, I want to conclude with a couple of things. So one thing is when we launch this, the kind of four most important letters on the screen are these four. So we're still very much in the early stages and not only because kind of, I know myself, the tool is liking sort of certain things that are kind of basic, but also it's fairly new kind of field for us. And we're kind of still experimenting and listening to users and, you know, looking at feedback. And those of you who have used it and there's that sort of, there's this feedback button there, we still read, would you read every single piece of feedback that people provide there? And some of you have actually provided feedback and I think we got back to you because I think it tells you that we can actually see who, who are the people providing feedback unless you choose us not to see that. So we're still, we're very open to suggestions and we're kind of, we're still, I just listed the kinds of things we're still thinking about. But what I, before I switch to questions, what I really want to sort of finish up with is what I'm really hoping this is contributing to and sort of the way kind of the vision that we're hoping to sort of be at least some part of is this vision where I'm sure a lot of people on this call really share where data sets really become as important and as useful and creditable a type of information as public scientific publications have become which means sort of there is the ecosystem where data providers actually publish that not only their data, they don't just, you know, tick the box that, okay, my data is public because it's sitting somewhere on some FTP server, but rather they actually supply reasonable structured metadata using community standards that other tools can search them, aggregate them, and understand them and actually find them, uh, which would hopefully enable and encourage, and again, like none of this, can, it's, it's not happening like in, in this order. I think all of these things are sort of feed off each other, sort of when data consumers are both encouraged and enabled to cite data properly, right? And I sort of uh, to, because A, we can find the data, we don't have to recreate it because someone has already created it, but also, you know, it's published in a, with persistent identifiers in a persistent place so that we could actually cite it. Uh, the same way that we cite scientific publications, which of course gives credit to data providers. And we're going back to the other side of this diagram saying, going back there saying, you know, that encourages data providers to publish the data um, uh, using the standards and sort of that enable uh, in a persistent way that uh, enables others to cite it. And so hopefully also kind of what we're doing is just part of this. I'm not saying we're solving the whole problem, what we're solving, so we're just solving the data discovery problem. And hopefully if we, as we're using community standards, um, hopefully developers could also contribute, other developers can contribute other tools um, to, you know, both help publish data, expand metadata, kind of find it, use it, visualize it, do it for domain specific data and so on. And basically, it ultimately create um, a healthy data ecosystem. And that's, I hope, sort of the, the kind of the sentiment that all of us probably have here. And I hope, and that's something that we hope that would help a little bit with our efforts, but it's certainly just a tiny, tiny part of that. And with that, as I've promised, I'll spend half of this on questions. So I think it would be nice to switch to questions. And I'm also eager to learn sort of what, what's on the mind of you guys. Thanks so much, Natasha. That was really great. And uh, I see a lot of questions have come in already. So um, people want to know a lot more. Um, so let me start with a question uh, that we get, that we often get from the repositories we work with. And that is someone asked, all our data sets found in Google Dataset Search have the data site logo and links to search.datasite.org. 
So will adding structured data markup to our own data set landing pages change that? Yes, that's definitely the case because uh, that, that is true. So data site has markup for all the, its pages. So we can always find the data sets there. But if the sort of if the primary source doesn't have the markup, we won't have it. But if you add the markup, use the same DOI, sort of one link to the other, we can again. I th think we do a reasonable, reasonable way of linking things together, and we're actually working now on making on this sort of at least some minimal data provenance where we can figure out sort of what is the primary data set and what is the secondary data set and sort of use the right logo. But the short answer to that is yes, adding markup to your own site is, will at least have that site in there. Did I answer the question? Was that? Yes, I see that. Right. The person who asked it says thanks for that. So I think that answered uh, his question. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I saw two questions related to versioning. Uh -huh. um, so one person asked, how do you currently handle similar data sets? We often have hundreds of data sets with very similar metadata, just slight differences. Um, and when searching in Google data set search, it mostly shows one random result. <laughs> yeah. So we don't do that very well, as you point out. It's one of the things, one of the many things we still need to do. Which is why having that beta monitor is really a nice hedge for me on anything. But to be sort of to be less tongue in cheek about this, um, yes, we don't handle it at all right now. Uh, it's something we definitely need to think about. It's also we haven't, to be honest, we haven't even looked very much into uh, metadata. I'm sure there is some metadata that um, helps with that, but I'm not. Um, um, I, I'm, we, haven't, we haven't really spent much time on that. So I think what happens now, and the reason it sort of shows random result is mostly because, you know, as any web search result, with sort of we're relying on web search, sort of a lot of our ranking and everything, they try to show some diversity in results. And I think that's where it comes from. So the right solution would probably be to group together all the different versions. And that's something we're thinking, sort of we're thinking along the lines of grouping together all the different versions of the same data set and kind of showing some representative from that cluster and saying there are more versions here. Um, that's definitely something I, I hear you. And I know it's can be, it's, it's, not, it's not a great experience. Yeah, and so related to that, someone asked, mm -hmm. data cleaning would result in a new version of the data file itself. So also, how do you approach file versioning? And this person also said, there must be a cache. So how do you handle updates and synchronization? Uh, updates to the, so, so I think I'll need clarification on that. Um, Actually, let me see. I, I, I try to see if I can see the question. I don't see the question myself. Um, so updates on the provider site and synchronizing with the existing version or? So maybe uh, David who asked the question wants to type some clarification. <laughs> then in the meantime, we can maybe uh, let me see whether that clarification is already there. No, so maybe we can go to another question while he uh, clarifies what his question is. Um, so we had a question, what is allowed in the markdown of the description? Will you also render figures, et cetera? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, we don't have a policy. Uh, I have with, so, Figures are difficult because, you know, again, we're dealing with the whole web and God knows what you find there. Uh, and while we're trying to do, like we're doing our best in identifying which pages are actually data sets and which pages are just, you know, SEOs putting data, schema data, data set on the page, we don't do a great job. So I think at the moment, I actually don't know categorically, figures will show up. But I think that I would suggest using links instead of figures just because we can never guarantee that we will be showing figures. Again, just because sometimes we may not know what's in the figure and it might not be super safe. Again, sort of the, the constraint that we're working with is since we don't, we take everything, right? And we crawl the whole web and we find everything on that whole web. And sort of we need to be a little bit careful there 
which is why, and I'm sure there's a question there somewhere about logos because it comes up all the time, which is also, yeah. <laughs> uh, right. I haven't seen the question, but I know I'm sure given that these are data provided and it's a very reasonable question. And I, I know some of you on the call, we have sort of exchanged emails and we try to help as much as we can on the logos. Same for the logos. We cannot, again, because we take things from the web and we don't really know what's, what's, what's in there, we, we, we don't actually take the logo from your metadata, as many of you have noticed. Uh, what we take is the logo from sort of whatever the organization logo exists um, in, the, in, in sort of knowledge graph or visual dictionary or something like that that we have. And so in the FAQ, we actually have a link on like, I don't have the logo, I don't like the logo that appears for my, um, for my organization, how can I change that? And this is not a data set search specific thing. There's nothing I can, we can do about this, uh, but there's a way for you to change it the way it appears on all Google products. And there's some links. So you have to be the owner, obviously, of the website for the organization. And then there's, there's some links to do that. We have very little control over that. If your organization is not at all in the knowledge graph, we can try to figure out a way to do this. But so basically if it doesn't appear anywhere in the panel, knowledge panel on the right hand side in main Google search, then we can try to help. But if it's there, we cannot really we we the data set search team has no control over those logos at that point. Yes, because someone did ask whether there are plans to use the logo provided in the metadata, but it sounds as if that's not uh, the approach most you're taking. Likely not. And I know that's true for the other for other Google products, and that's why we take the cue from other Google products. It's just unless you know AI gets so so smart that we know that that's exactly the logo, and it really is the logo, and it's really the logo of that organization, which it could. But I mean, um, we we can't. If, if if you think about it from sort of again a search engine point of view, and someone who tries to optimize or show something that you know is not necessarily a logo, how would we sort of know that? And I'm sure, yes, there are ways to do this, but we're sort of trying to figure out what other things we could do that would have sort of bigger that would improve the discovery more. But but I hear you, and I understand that it's I I, I sort of appreciate how important that is and it sort of highlights the organization and everything. And we try to do what we can, but we also have to be a little bit careful not to have something completely offensive show up in one of the search results right at the top. No, yeah, that makes sense. So David also got back to us and he said mm -hmm. that he did mean when the provider updates the original file. So how does it so, now work in terms of caching and updates and versions on your end? Right. So, uh, that's another thing that we don't have very much control over. So sitemaps help because in sitemap you can sort of say how often things get updated. Things do get recrawled uh, with reasonable regularity. We try to work with the crawl team a little bit to see sort of to make sure things don't get completely stale. Um, but so we kind of we downstream from crawl so once things get recrawled they get updated on our site pretty quickly like a couple of days three four days at most um, the rest is defined by the crawl and like i said we try to work with the crawl team to make sure the pages don't get too stale but um we don't fully control that unfortunately Okay, thanks. So I saw three questions related to Google Scholar. So let me mm -hmm. move on to those. Uh, so the first question was, does this mean you're going into the direction of being a Google Scholar for data? Um, that's, I, uh, depends on what that, what that question implies. What does it mean to be a Google Scholar for data? We do sort of, we jokingly do say that we're trying to be the Google Scholar for data in a sense that, you know, we're providing a discovery, sort of the same way, you know, you can go to Google Scholar and find, um, you know, publication on any publisher's website. Uh, you know, you can hopefully eventually go into data set search and find a data set on any provider's website. Another big part of Google Scholar is the sort of cross citations and links. And again, for the explicit links between data sets, we're hoping to incorporate that as much as possible. Uh, we have talked about, that's probably further down the line, about things like um, author profiles or sort of, you know, I think for many of 
academics, like all of, probably most people on this call, including myself, the stuff, the part we like about Google Scholars, then going to our own profile page and seeing, okay, here are all my papers, here's who size them and so on. Uh, we're certainly thinking in that direction. That's probably not super near term. I'm assuming sort of, I'm trying to kind of interpret what the question of, um, are you going in the direction of being Google Scholar for data implies? But okay. I, I, would, I would imagine it's one of those three things. So I hope I answered those. And if it's not, please clarify now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So yeah, if, if that didn't answer your question, please let us know in the Q&A. So someone else asked, um, so you're showing um, data citations um, mm -hmm. for the results in Google Dataset Search. How are those counted in Google Scholar? So at this point, in a really sort of very, very basic heuristic way. And you can actually see that when you sort of click on that link, you can see what is the, we're essentially doing a more or less, not exactly, but more or less the equivalent of the query for uh, DOI, and then the full name of the data set. And then we try to account a little bit for cases where the name of the data set is some sort of generic term like public schools or something like that, to make sure that, because that's not super useful. So, it's something that we know we have, like at this point, like I usually joke, it's not the number I'm proud of, the one that we show there. I mean, it gives you some indication. It's, and we know sort of plenty of ways of how to make it better. It has really just been an issue of resources, how to make that number better. To really, so what, what I would really hope to do, and we really hope that we have sort of enough data now to start doing is, to really kind of not just do sort of the dumb kind of search for the, you know, is the string ever mentioned, but to kind of look at the context of how it's mentioned to see how people actually cite data. Because again, it's not as straightforward as citing papers yet, right? We have all seen, you know, it could be in the footnote with just a, oh, we we'll also search for URL. It could be in the footnote just by URL, uh, or it could be, you know, we use the data set name, whatever, MNIST uh, or whatever, ImageNet, uh, and that's it, right? and uh, it's not really even referenced anywhere. So for some kind of for something like DBpedia, you know, people don't even cite them anymore, right? In some sense, it's kind of indication of huge success, but at the same time, it really makes it harder to count. So figuring out how people cite data sets until we get to the point where it's just as straightforward as doing citation graph in Google Scholar, I think, we'll, I think it, we're probably some ways away from that. And so we will need to kind of figure out how, how, how to do this. We, we know, I know we need to do this better. Um, at this point, it's like very, very, very basic heuristics. Yeah, and so the, the third question was, are you planning to include data citations and uh, their corresponding counts into the Google Scholar profiles? But I think you already mentioned uh, that while, uh, while answering the uh, other questions. Uh, I'm not sure I did. So, so for the moment, these two are separate products. We're talking to the scholar team quite a lot. Um, we're thinking of sort of how and when and at what point it would make sense to kind of cross-reference in both directions. We haven't gotten there yet. It's, it's clearly, I mean, the products are clearly related. And like I said, we're already kind of using a lot of their information. Um, I'm hoping that it would make sense down the line to integrate them a little bit more. Okay. Um, yeah, so a, a different question. Someone asked, uh, a lot of human subject data sets are not public, but the metadata is or could be. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you start using information inside the data, those data sets would fall under the table. Um, so do you know how you are planning to handle that? Um, so that's a very good question. So, 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 so first of all, yes. So it's a very important point that sometimes kind of gets misunderstood that the date of, to be discovered by data set search, the date itself does not have to be public. Uh, metadata has to be public and crawlable, right? So sort of the same way again, scholar works, right? You can find a paper and you know, you go to a publisher's website and have to pay you 30 bucks. At least you know who to pay the 30 bucks to. Of course, most of you academics, you know, have to pay the 30 bucks. Um, but, um, so that's the same question. It's actually not specific for data set search, I think, because if the file with the P persons, uh, the personally identifiable information is available to crawl or to crawl, then it, 
it's a problem sort of on the provider side, right? You wouldn't want that to be crawlable. You want your robots.txt file or some way to, you know, to require a login because then the crawl is not going to go there. So I think, I mean, in some sense, obviously we have a lot of like, I, actually, I don't know. I would hope because the same problem comes up in Google search, right? So if we can crawl something that's, um, which that shouldn't be public and it ended up being public, uh, you know, it could appear in the main Google search, which will have, will have even more eyeballs. And I think Google has pretty strict sort of takedown mechanisms, so you can actually sort of say, you know, take this down. And I think we're legally obligated. Uh, I, I don't know the mechanics of this, but I'm pretty sure we're sort of legally obligated to take it down with a certain period of time. And so that will translate to us as well. As I've mentioned, we don't have our own crawl, we don't run our own crawl. So if the private data ends up being available to a crawler, um that's kind of that's that's what, what you know as soon as you find that you know that should be taken down i we don't have any specific mechanism so the only specific mechanism to say this data is private don't crawl it and don't show it in google search is robots txt or just a login or some sort of requiring some credentials that the crawler doesn't have because whatever we get, if we get it, that means main Google search has it too. Uh, so I see some clarification from the person who asked the question. Um, he's saying, I was referring more to data sets that are meant to be found crawled, but require some scientific credentials for access to the actual data. How can Google data sets ser search learn about means and variable labels, et cetera? So the means and variable labels and stuff like that, which is not, PII could be in the metadata, right? So there's even like a field for variables, for example, metadata, and you could put some of that in the description. And I think there is room in the definition of schema or data set to, to sort of add more to this of this type of information there, including things like biases in the data, for instance. So I'm assuming what you're saying is you don't expect Google data set search to actually look at the data and analyze it if the data is private because we wouldn't want to. Uh, but if the provider or the publisher of the data analyzes it and wants to publish certain statistics on the data that the provider feels are okay to publish, then that could be part of the metadata. And if I'm still not answering your question, please clarify a little more. I'm hoping sort of I'm going in the right direction at least. Okay, so yeah, no, he said, thanks, this answers his question, and he said, the way to go is to lobby uh, with schema.org, so. Uh. Yes, so I think that, that, that is a very good point, is to uh, bring up on the schema.org issues tracker, sort of what are better ways to, because right now I think there's just basically a field for variables, and that's about it. Um, the one thing I do want to mention on that, though, and sort of those of you who have tried to sort of push for sort of additional um, properties and more detailed descriptions on, on schema.org. One of the things, particularly for sort of for schema.org, there's always a pushback to keep things as simple as possible. And I sort of, before I actually started bringing that, I didn't appreciate that pushback, my own background being an ontology knowledge representation, and I like all the expressive power of everything and be able to say anything with as much reification as possible. The thing is, because this schema.org is designed for sort of any webmaster being able to do this and not requiring any specific knowledge representation skills, it's try, it is intentionally kind of dumbing things down a little bit and making things, that's not a very charitable way. I'm not, I don't mean it in an uncharitable way. It's making it as difficult to screw up as possible because people will still screw up, but at least screw up in a way that we can kind of figure out and normalize and clean up. Um, so anything too complicated probably belongs in the extension. So schema.org has an extension mechanism. So for example, there is, you know, bioschemas.org that extends it to the bio biology and sort of life sciences domain. And there is, I think, the earth, uh, earth sciences guys are talking about uh, extensions there. So some basic, I think it's certainly still at the basic schema.org data set level, there needs to be a little bit more a structured description of what's in the data, like I said, you know, means by like any description of biases and sort of um, that kind of stuff. But then anything more detailed probably needs to go into the 
extensions just because it will probably be too difficult to do it in a way that's not that easy to screw up. And so we also received some more questions related, related to metadata, probably not surprising. Um, uh -huh. So someone asked, are you planning to display more structured metadata if available? Um, because they noticed that uh, at the moment, everything that's not in the abstract or description is hidden. Mm, that's not quite the case. Uh, we don't show everything yet uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, but we do show temporal coverage, spatial coverage, uh, well, DOIs, of course, um, funder. Uh, there's a list. I, I don't remember exactly everything that we show, but there's, it's definitely more than just description. Okay. Unless it was, unless, so the reason you might not be seeing it, maybe it wasn't, like sometimes, you know, if it wasn't, um, you know, there's some syntax was wrong or something was off, but generally we do try, we, 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 we don't show everything, I know that, and we do plan to show more, um, but we certainly show more than just description. And if there's some other specific fields you have questions about, just feel free to clarify and I'll try to, um, I'll, I'll try to explain it. We just show some of the pending, I, I just noticed the message in the text. Uh, variables, actually that's a good question. I don't remember if we show variables. We certainly have nothing against showing them. I, I, don't, I don't remember, maybe we just didn't get around to that. There are a few things that we do need to show that we just don't show yet. Um, and I also think I saw a couple of questions about examples. Um, so one here is, um, do you have an example of a data source that um, has covered many of the things you're looking for when indexing sources? So kind of examples they can look at. Um, so there's a little bit, there's like one, but I think it's a fake example in the developer's documentation. To be honest, any page that you see in data set search is an example. So what I often do when I want to like show how that, so you see, you see the result that you like, uh, go copy the link from that result, like the, you know, the link that, like the button that takes you to the result. So copy that and put it into the structured data testing tool and you'll, because anybody can, so for any site, you don't have to own a page to see the metadata on it. So what I often do, and I actually, I start with that when someone says, oh, well, the metadata doesn't show up correctly. I will basically just copy that link and put it into the structured data testing tool. And I'm sure other companies, it doesn't have to be the Google one. It could be any other one. Uh, and there's some open source ones as well, uh, just to see what kind of metadata it has and how. And you can, in there, you can sort of see it side by side. You can see the source that gets generated, the source of the page and sort of what it gets translated to in terms of structured data. Um, so you have millions, of, I mean, I've, I could let's say you have millions of examples. No, very good. I think uh, people will be looking at those after the webinar. Um, mm -hmm. There was also a question um, whether there will be an API exposed for developers to use for validation and query. Wait, API for validation query. What? Can you please clarify what you mean by valid, API for validation query? Uh, let me see. There was a question that preceded that, so maybe there is a clarification mm -hmm. in there. Um, there are many related entities that also would benefit from adding to search. Are there plans to create search for other scientific resources like Linux containers? And then as a follow-up to that, will there be an API exposed for developers to use for validation and query? That's the complete uh, okay. <laughs> question. So I think the two questions in there. So in terms of including other artifacts, we're mostly working on data and data sets, but we are kind of, would, we're looking at sort of other types of data as well. So for example, to give an example, in, in there are many disciplines where publishing structured data is not the norm at all, and they never really do that. And the only way they really publish the data is as figures and tables in, in, in their scientific publications. And 
you know, the parts of material science are like that. They're sort of famous on parts of physics. They just don't publish structured data. They not like you won't find it on data set or anywhere else. Um, and so one of the things we're looking at is seeing if we can uh, extract those uh, figures, sort of metadata about those figures and tables and say, you know, if you ask if there is data that, you know, maps, you know, pH levels to wavelengths in silicon, and there's, you know, a, there's a bunch of papers that have this graph that we can point you to that graph and say, here is, here is the data. It just happens to be available only as part of a PDF. So that's the first question in terms of, but, but we're still kind of mostly focusing on data. We're not looking at things like workflows. We're not yet at least. And, I, I, and there's so much to do just with the data that I think we'll focus on that for a while. Workflows, containers, sort of this sort of work, uh, other types of artifacts. At the moment, we're not looking at them. In terms of the API, I'm not sure what you mean by, anyway, the, I, I'll answer that question sort of in a more generic way because it does come up a lot. I think there's, program. there is a clarification now. Mm -hmm. um, she said programmatic API as in an endpoint to send a JSON LD and validate it, like the web testing tool, but one that can be done programmatically. Oh, 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 I see. Um, I don't think so. I, uh, and no, I, I, I'm not. So if there was a plan for such thing, it wouldn't be from data set search. It would be more generic for all the structured data. Um, I am not aware of any such plans. I, I would like to understand a little bit better why. So, so if I think of any data set repository, you know, all the pages are generated sort of using the same piece of code probably. So validating one page in the testing tool is probably going to give you a pretty good idea um, about you know whether or not it will work for other pages uh, so i'm i mean i i can i guess i can see some use cases but i i haven't i don't think that's at least from uh, someone else could do this this is an open standard but i think from our side i haven't seen anything like that and again i'm not Maybe you can clarify the use case. I'm not quite sure I understand the use case. Okay, so maybe this is then something to follow up after the call. Mm -hmm. um, I see we're already getting very close to the hour. Um, there are still questions coming in. Uh, and as I said at the beginning, I don't think we'll be able to answer everything, but um, we'll try to, uh, Natasha, if you're happy to help us answer those questions later, we'll share I'll, the answers. I'll, 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 uh, I'll do my best, yes. Okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, do you then have any sort of final words for us before we uh, finish this um, webinar? I, I guess, again, I think sort of the way I understand the audience on this call, I think sort of, I think we're all in it together. And sort of discovery will be only as good as the data that gets published and that can be discovered. So if you could encourage your communities uh, to publish data and to publish metadata and to structure it in a way that can be discovered, hopefully not just by us. And I'm hoping, again, we're just a small part of this. I'm hoping kind of others, uh, that having all this metadata out there in a structured form will enable others to build sort of awesome tools to, that do other things and sort of will have a healthy ecosystem where kind of everybody ends up benefiting. So that would be my parting words, I guess. Oh, but we're all in this together. We can do it on just on our end. And I hope we can all sort of work on this together. Well, I think uh, data side couldn't agree more. We, uh, we also... Uh, <laughs> I know, and you've been a great supporter and you helped us enormously in the very beginning. So I'm super grateful to data side. And actually that's probably, I, I thought I also said that in the beginning, but I think I forgot sort of uh, data site was sort of believed in this from the very beginning and was super supportive from the very beginning. And I think they were the first sort of large uh, site that actually marked up the data and gave examples to others on how to do this. So thank you. Thank you enormously for that. Yeah, thanks. We're really, really excited to be involved and also very happy to uh, to work with the repositories on the, on the call to ensure they... Uh, they can all be indexed as well. So uh, yeah, Natasha, thanks so much. It was a really great talk and I'm sure people learned a lot about how they can work thank with you. Google dataset search. And uh, thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye bye.